Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. We thank you because the divine teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit, has always been present with us. Thank you, Lord, for the deep insight you are giving us as we are studying this second book of the Bible, the Exodus. We thank you for the inspiration, for the enlightenment, for the illumination, for the insight that you have given unto us since we began our series of studies in the book of Exodus. We thank you because you have opened our eyes to see solutions to problems that have been long standing. We thank you, Father, because you have made us to see that you are in control of all nature, all things, all governments, all situations, all conditions in life. We thank you because you make us to see that even though there might have been times that human beings, either as individuals or groups, either as self impostors or as constituted bodies, there might have been times they'll put up themselves as if they are the all in all, like Pharaoh and Egypt over Israel. Yet, we're seeing in all these studies that even though these things may appear like that to those who walk by sight, that behind the scene, that you still control events in this world, that ultimately your own will will be fulfilled, and that you are sovereign, you are the controller of all things. Father, as we study on, may we see that in our individual lives, nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens without your permission. And that eventually, ultimately, good will overcome evil. Ultimately, your purpose will overcome all the various circumstances, conflicting circumstances that may appear in our lives. And also, for a group of people who believe in you, like the church, or any other group of people believing in you, a family, groups of people like friends, Groups of people in the village. Groups of people that have bound themselves together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We know that you will always be in control. Help us, Lord, to be wise and to come to the right side. And to know that Jesus Christ will reign. And that his will, his word, will eventually take supremacy over all things that we see now. Help us, Lord, in whatever we see, whatever we experience not to allow ourselves to be confused or to be discouraged or to be alarmed by any of the things that we see, but always to know that yours will be the final authority, the final decision, and yours will be the glory at, at the end. We come again to the study of Exodus today, O Lord, and we pray, O Lord, that you open our eyes to behold wondrous, wonderful things out of your book. And we pray that by your Spirit, You'll take these words and apply them to every heart that listens today. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Once again, we come to our study of the book of Exodus. If you are like many other people, it's had been, it has been a rewarding and enriching time. If you have been like me as I go through these chapters of Exodus, you would have been surprised at as to the marvelous things that the Lord is doing, that the Lord is revealing. I believe that every member of this church should make himself or herself available for these studies. And I'm going to plead with you who are here. You know, if you have been coming for some time, you know the richness of this book of Exodus. If you have been coming for some time, you know the things that appear to have been hidden from the common reader of the Bible, from the average Christian who even has given himself to the normal regular study of the word by himself or herself. And you see how God has so much favored us in leading us to the rich pasture of the scriptures. And so you'll help in this way. You'll tell other members of the church who at the present have not made the Monday Bible study a compulsory thing for themselves. And you will tell other people to your mind, not even be members of the church, Christians who want to go deeper, Christians who want to understand the word of God, 
Christians who want the enrichment, the illumination of the word of God to be something for them and to really make them grow in a speedy manner and to make them useful in this life that we have, you will invite them, you will tell them, and they will have to come. And I'm sure you'll want to share the outlines with them. You'll want to share the case sets with them. These are rich, rich studies that none of us can afford to miss. Today we're coming into chapter 6. And if you look at your outline, the title is Revelation of God's Name and God's Power. Can I tell you this? Whatever you have learned, whatever you have known, in the book of Exodus, Without this, I don't think your knowledge is complete. You see, last week, Thursday, I spoke about Abraham. I spoke about Abraham's seed. Now, you would have thought that Abraham knew God. Of course he knew God. Of course he knew God. But then you'll find in the chapter we're going to study today that God said there was a part of him not revealed unto Abraham. But he was going to reveal it unto Moses at this time of Egypt's trial. And I want you to understand that whatever we have studied up to this point, there's a new revelation of God that we are going to discover. And I'm going to tell you something because I know what follows after chapter 6. When you get out of chapter 6 and you get into chapter 7, I tell you everything changes everything changes so today it's like we are at a turning point we're at a crossroad today we're at a point where god makes a new revelation of himself unto moses and unto the children of israel and after this chapter i would like you to come and see the dramatic events that take place it's like moses was just changed well what do you expect if there's a new revelation of god's name a new revelation of God's power. I'm sure by the time you come out of that supernatural event, I'm sure that things will not remain the same anymore. When you come to chapter 7, you see Moses in authority. You see Moses in power. You see that from chapter 7 onwards, and I'll be talking much about that next week, no complaint, no weakness, no discouragement, nothing at all to show. That this Moses had ever complained that he was a stammerer, he was not eloquent, the people will not believe him, and there was nothing he could do. How will the children of Israel believe him, or how will Pharaoh believe him when this has not happened, this has not happened, that has not happened? When you come out of chapter 6, there's nothing like that again. Dramatic things. And I'm sure that as you study these things, the same thing you will find in your life. In fact, I'm praying for you that the study of today will make a revelation of God's name, revelation of God's power unto you so much that after this study, and I'm sure that you are going to pray after the study, so that after this study, the weakness we saw in you before, the discouragement we saw in you before, the perplexity we saw in you before, and the dilly-dally, the, the instability, the inconsistency we saw in you before, and believing we shall see it no more in Jesus' name. Now come on to chapter 6. Well, before the opening verses of chapter 6, I like to pick up from the end of chapter 5, just to tell you where we left Moses. You know, sometimes as you go from chapter to chapter, you sometimes forget where you left the man you are studying about, where you left the series of events you are studying about at the last week's study. So then, Let's pick up from the last two verses of chapter 5 so that we can pick it up at the time that we ended. Look at it. Exodus chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered the people at all. That's the place we ended up last week. So far, the ministry of Moses to Israel in Egypt appeared not to have yielded any positive result. 
you can see that he had questions on his mind unanswered. You can see that he bemoaned his weakness. You can see that he thought his ministry was a wasted life, a wasted event, wasted energy. Maybe you have been at, that, at such a point in your life that you questioned, why am I serving God? Why am I worshipping God? Why am I praying? Why am I depending upon the promises of God? Why did I ever fast? Why did I ever proclaim the promise of God publicly? Here we are. You are just at the point where Moses found himself being weak in faith and lacking in spiritual understanding, not fully knowing the ways of the Lord at that moment. He was discouraged by what he heard, by what he felt, by what he saw. Three things that we have problems with. What we see, what we feel, what we hear. The same thing with Moses, what he heard Pharaoh saying. What he heard the elders and the officers of the children of Israel saying. What he felt, his soul sank within him. There was the emptiness, the shallowness within him. There was the regret of an unfulfilled ministry within him. He felt it and then he saw it. He saw the oppression of the taskmasters over the children of Israel. Three things that normally constitute problems for us. What we see, what we feel, what we hear. And so because of all that, he returned unto the Lord and will say he prayed. Will say he poured out his heart before the Lord. And I've just read that to you. You can see that the pouring out of his heart to the Lord was really complaint. It was really regret. It was really a question of why, why, why. Why have you sent me? Why did I leave my job? Why did I come into this situation? Why did I have to come to Pharaoh? Why have I declared the name of God unto the children of Israel? Why, why, why? Have you ever come to that point in your life? Where all that you have coming from you is why? 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 You see, after his seeming failure, as he returned to the Lord, he, dis he, dis he discovered or he, di he, he disclosed the discouragement that he had. This discouragement he had met with was more than his weak faith and inexperienced heart could bear. There was no need for Moses, though, to be discouraged by Pharaoh's initial attitude and reaction. You know, if we are discouraged in our lives, I'll tell you this, it's because we have overlooked something. I praise the name of the Lord, that God will never leave us in darkness. If you turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3, Verses 19 and 20. You see the faithfulness of God. Did God deceive Moses? Did God tell Moses it will be a bed of roses? All easy. Everything will be going for him. The moment he said this, everybody will say yes. The moment he went this direction, everybody will say yes. No, not at all. You see, God never deceives us. As he told us, there will be, ne be no temptation. As he told us, there will be no trial. As he told us, there will be no persecution. As he told us that people will not confront us. Well, Jesus Christ told us, he said, In the world ye shall have tribulation. You know, when tribulation comes and when trial comes, when temptation comes, then we begin to complain as if God did not tell us before. But you know, God also has told us the outcome. He said, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Do you remember what God had told Moses at the very beginning of his ministry? He said, Moses, listen to this. I know that Pharaoh will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And yet, he gave him assurance. He said, eventually, I'm going to stretch out my mighty hand. And after that, listen to that. And after that, not before that, after that, he will let you go. Why would Moses go before the Lord and be grumbling and be complaining and saying, since I came, you have not delivered your people at all? Moses, God told you before, my beloved sister, you say, well, the persecution I've received and the complaints and everything and the conflict I've got since I became a Christian. Oh, he told you before. Everyone that will live godly shall suffer persecution. Why are you grumbling and complaining as if Jesus did not tell you before? 
But then he said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He told us there will be trouble, but then that's not the end. He told us there will be triumph. Trouble, pause, triumph, after. He said, after that, he will let you go. Whatever we hear, whatever we see, whatever we feel, there is no need to be alarmed by the enemy or to be discouraged by our circumstances. I've read this to you before in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 30. The counsel of the Lord shall stand. And you see, God will do all his pleasure. That's in uh, Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10. We've read that before. You know what God says? He says this in Isaiah chapter 43 and in verse 13. He says, I will walk. And who shall let it? Who shall hinder it? Let me tell you this. Neither Pharaoh nor his colleagues today or his juniors. I think many of your persecutors are the juniors of Pharaoh. They are not as hard as Pharaoh. They are not as difficult as Pharaoh. They are not, a, they are not as wicked as Pharaoh. They are the juniors of Pharaoh. If God dealt with Pharaoh, their senior, he will deal with that junior that is trying to make trouble, trying to hinder you on your way to eternal life, on your way to heaven. Neither Pharaoh nor his colleagues and his juniors today can thwart the plan and the purpose of the Almighty. But you know something? God is wonderful. God is wonderful. Moses went before the Lord and he complained and he grumbled and he showed his anxiety and showed his worry and showed his weakness of faith and showed, in, and showed his inexperienced heart. What will God do to that man? Do you think he will chastise him? Do you think that he will set him aside because of his weak faith and foolish and unlearned questions? No, not at all. That brings us to chapter 6. God encouraged him, renewed the commission, and revealed, and revealed his name and his power unto his servant. Wonderful God. Beautiful situation. That instead of setting him aside, that your complaints are too many. You know, the moment a person is born again, he has a lot of questions. A person is a baby in Christ. He has a lot of questions. A person that has just known the Lord, and this persecution comes, and this trial comes, and this difficulty comes. He has a lot of questions. What will God do? Will God remove the name of that person out of the book of life? No, not on your life. Not at all. You know what he's going to do? He's going to give that new Christian, baby in Christ, he's going to give you reassurance. And he's going to give you a recommissioning of what he wants you to do. That is what brings us to chapter 6. And stay with me. Chapter 6 is marvelous chapter. Marvelous chapter. There are four points we have here. Number one, divine encouragement for fainting hearts. You ever felt like you are fainting? Like you are discouraged? Like you cannot move on again? Divine discouragement for fainting hearts. Number two, unbelief of anguished souls. That's what causes unbelief. Unbelief of anguished souls. Number three, the genealogy of God's ambassadors. Number four, God's unchanging commission. Let's come back to number one. And it's in Genesis chapter 6. Let me start with you from verse 1. Open your Bible. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with his strong hand shall he let them go. And with his strong hand shall he drive them out of the land. That verse 1 alone, if I had time, you know we don't have enough time in all these studies because we are always rushing for time. Because we have to make the whole study to be at a particular period of time. If I had time, that single verse alone is enough to take all our time tonight. Look at it. You see, that verse fully answered the questions and all the ruminations, all the things, all the thoughts, the imaginations, everything in the heart of Moses. God put everything into that single verse and he answered everything. That's how we know that God is God. God is God. You see, when we have a lot of questions, you go to the doctor and you have this complaint and you have this complaint and you have this complaint. Before they can give you the answer to all those complaints, they're going to speak in so many words. But in the case of God, it's going to compress everything into one single verse. Let me tell you what I mean. You see, Moses had complained. 
He had been worried about the seeming delay on God's part. And then, God, how did God answer that? God said, now. Moses said, oh Lord, it appears you are delaying. It appears I can't see anything at all. It appears that since I came, time is going. The people have not been delivered. God answered by just saying, now. Then another question that Moses had, Moses said, I didn't see any deliverance. I didn't see any liberty. You said you were going to deliver the people. I have not seen anything. God now answered that part and said, now shall thou see. You have not seen, you will see. In fact, now you will see. Then he said, he had another complaint. He said, this man Pharaoh is so wicked and so evil, nobody can do anything to him. I've seen him. In fact, the moment I saw him, he increased the punishment. He increased all the trouble of the children of Israel. Look at the answer of God. He's still in that verse 1. Now shall thou see what I will do. Have you seen what Pharaoh has done? Now you are going to see who is supreme, who is greater, who is eternal. Now you are going to see whose power cannot be resisted by anyone. Now shall thou see what I will do. Due to who? Because the real problem we have, oh God, is this Pharaoh. Because if he tells those taskmasters to kill, they kill. If he tells those Egyptians to oppress, they oppress. Nobody can handle him. Then God answered that part and said, Now shalt thou see what I will do to who? To Pharaoh. You see, God knows all your problems. He knows all the questions you have on your mind. He knows all that you are going through. And he says, now, you see, let me tell you this. Do you know there are times when the problem is so much with that wife? And the wife just, the wife does not go to God again because of the discouragement, because of the oppression, because of the persecution. When God is just about to say, now shall thou see, the woman has packed her load and gone out. And instead of waiting just for the next hour, the next hour that God will manifest himself, the next moment that God will manifest himself, the time when God has risen up from his throne and saying, Now shall thou see the woman has parked and gone. Have you seen this sometimes in the place of work, a beloved brother, a beloved sister, having real trouble with the boss? And she's gone this way, she has written petition, she's done everything she could do, and she has prayed, she has fasted, she had called upon the church to pray for her. Just at the time God was going to answer, the sister had resigned, said, I cannot bear this again. Now shall thou see. You know what I'm telling you? There are times when God is just about ready to start the work, and then you have gone. You know, there are times you come to the church, and as you have been in the church, you pray, and you are saved, you are born again, you have a beautiful Christian life. But then just immediately after that, it appears as persecution. It appears as demonic attack. It appears as sickness. It appears there's something you cannot explain. And then you have prayed, you have fasted, you have called upon other people, you have sought counseling. And just about the time God is about to come and reveal his new name, his great power, his great majesty, reveal it to you and reveal it through you. You are packed already. You say, I can't come to church again. Because God has not done anything, you complain like Moses. But you see, when Moses complained, he waited for the time of the Lord. And the Lord said, Now shalt thou see what I will do unto Pharaoh. I'm praying that God will give you that patience. That God will give you that heart. That will rest upon God and say, Today may be my day. Today may be the time that God is saying now. Today may be the time that God is telling me I will see what I have not seen. Today may be the time when God is telling me I will do what I'm complaining that he has not done. Today may be the time of God dealing with Pharaoh and dealing with the colleagues of Pharaoh that have been surprised God has not done anything with in the past. Because of that, you know what Jesus said? Impatience possess ye your souls. Impatience. That is, remain in that patience. Remain with the Lord. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Because you know, a thousand years is like a day with the Lord. And a day like a thousand years. So if you will wait upon the Lord, you will see what the Lord will do. Then he said, for with a strong hand. Will he let you go? And then with a strong hand, shall he drive them out of his land? That now he may be reluctant, but I'm, so, I'm going to so walk on the heart of Pharaoh. 
that in fact he will call you and say go 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 i don't want you here again now you can go and serve your lord in fact if you stay through and in all this in all this series you will come to the time when pharaoh called upon moses and he said moses pray for me moses i have seen moses have not done the will of god i'm telling you that god can deal with any heart any heart. after all he created everybody he created everybody and he can he can deal with every heart you know what the bible says the hearts of the kings are the hands of the lord eternity it whithersoever he will now let me just follow through on this you see moses had been discouraged because of pharaoh's cruelty but now God revealed what? His sovereignty and his power. And he said, now shall thou see what I will do unto Pharaoh. You see, in this promise that God gave, there were no eaves, no birds, no perhaps, no maybes about it. God didn't say, maybe I'll do this by and by. Perhaps I'll fulfill my promise by and by. If this happens, if Pharaoh will cooperate with me, maybe I can deliver these children of Israel. Maybe if conditions work right, if the economy changes, maybe if these taskmasters, if I can get their attention, maybe I will do something. No if, no perhaps, no but, no maybe. What God said is, is said with absolute certainty. You know the promises God has given you, he gives those promises with absolute certainty. There's nothing for you to be afraid of. You have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other certainty that can come into your life than this one. And therefore stay with God. In fact, I must at this time look at some other promises of God. This is marvelous for a real child of God. Now come with me to Isaiah chapter 55. You, may, you might have known this before, but open your Bible. Isaiah chapter 55 in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, says the Lord. Are you discouraged? My thoughts are not your thoughts. Are you thinking, I'm going to perish, I'm going to die, all these conditions are too much for me. I've prayed, I've fasted, I've sought counseling, I've seen coordinator, I've seen pastor, I've seen everybody. It appears that Moses said he was sent to deliver us. I cannot see the deliverance. Wait a minute. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways, my ways, says the Lord. Verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Verse 10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Verse 11. So shall my word be. So shall my word be. So shall my word be. That goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that. Which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing. Whereunto I sent it. Can we apply that to Moses for a moment? That, that I mean that verse 11. So shall my word be. Now Moses, I appear to you at the burning bush. And I said, I'm calling you, that I've seen the affliction of the children of Israel. Now go and deliver them and bring them out of the place that they will come and sacrifice unto me. And hold the feast unto me. So shall my word be, that goeth out of my mouth. Moses, did I tell you, I've seen the affliction of the children of Israel. And I've remembered the covenant I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now the time has come. I am come down to deliver the children of Israel. Now Moses, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. As the Lord told you now, I'm deviating from Moses a little. I'm concentrating on you. As the Lord told you, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Oh, and you say rest? All I've seen is trouble. All I've seen is turmoil. All I've seen is conflict. All I've seen is difficulty. Listen to me. So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, but, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It says it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have sent it. You know what the word of God says? It says that if you are sick, it will heal you. If you are confused, it's going to comfort you. It's going to, it's going to lay everything to rest. 
It says if you're having any struggle, any battle with sin, it's going to give you the victory over sin because sin shall not have dominion over you. Uh, you say the temptation is so much, the conflict is so much, in fact, the confusion in my mind is so much. Look at this. So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Has God given you any promise? Has God given you any assurance? While you are praying, while you are singing, while you are, maybe you are having a dream, while it reveals something to you, whatever it is, that's according to the word of God. So shall my word be. It may appear that there is no fulfillment at present. It may appear as if you are having difficulty knowing, understanding that God will do what he has said. But God will do it. God will do it. He has said the word will not return unto him void. It will accomplish that which he has said. Uh, look at this in Numbers chapter 23. In Numbers chapter 23, we're looking at it from verse 19. Beautiful verse of scripture, beautiful promise. I don't know any Christian can just go through life without promises like this that we're looking at. Look at it in verse 19. God is not a man, praise the Lord. You know, God is not like a human father, human mother. It's not like a uncle, not like a cousin, not like a principal at school, not like a headmistress, not like all the people we have known that give a lot of promises, but they never fulfill a jot of those promises. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said, as he said, as he said, and shall he not do it? And as he is spoken, and shall he not make it good? He has all the power to do it. He will do it. And he remembers, he never forgets anything. You know, if God said anything, he will do it. If you listen to the uh, radio message yesterday, you will see that the things that God said 3,000 years before, 2,000 years before, 700 years before, 500, 400 years before, he fulfilled everything to the letter. When God gives a promise, he never forgets. When God gives his word, he never forgets. He's not a son of man that will give us a promise just last month or just last year, and now they are forgotten. God never forgets. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and in verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. Then saith the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Let's come back to Moses. Moses, here you are, grumbling and complaining, thinking, what will God do? What has God done? Here God says, I will hasten my word to perform it. And let's move away from Moses. Let's come to you. Here you are saying, look at all the promises of God. And I've been holding on to the promises of God. Remember last Thursday again, that Abraham... He was not weak in faith, but he was strong, glorifying God. And if you are Abraham's seed, you should have the faith of Abraham. In fact, he looked not at his body now dead, because he believed in that God who is able to raise the dead, and the God that called those things which be, which be not as though they were. Do not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but believe God, knowing that what he has promised is able to perform. And so we have, we've, we've done a little on Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Let's come back. Exodus chapter 6. Now I'm going to read to you from verse 2. Exodus chapter 6, from verse 2. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Pharaoh is Pharaoh. I am the Lord. The taskmasters are human beings. They are not spirits. I am the Lord. Your difficulties are difficulties of time, not of eternity. I am the Lord. The Lord that has been in existence from all eternity past and to eternity future. Look at verse 3. I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. By the name God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them think about that he told moses he said have you seen all those ways in which abraham prayed and he had authority with me and he was called my friend and he asked almost anything and i exalted him and i gave him promises and i fulfilled the promises have you seen what i did for him in his old age he said moses do you know with all those victories of abraham he was acting on partial knowledge of my name 
I only reveal to him a part of myself. I only reveal to him that I'm God Almighty. On that partial knowledge of my name, he got everything he got. Now, Moses, I'm going to favor you. I'm going to reveal unto you what I didn't reveal unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want you to think about this. That the people in the Old Testament, they were acting on partial knowledge. Partial knowledge of the power of God. Partial knowledge of the name of God Almighty. And yet, do you realize that they did exploits in the midst of the partial knowledge? Now, God has given us a fuller revelation of himself through Jesus Christ, the express image of his personality. The fullness of the Godhead, the one that is full of grace and full of truth. He has revealed himself unto us in a fuller measure. If those people of the Old Testament, on the basis of partial knowledge of his name, of his power, of his truth, of his grace, if they did all that they did, you tell me what we're able to do today on the fullness of the knowledge of the revelation of God himself. Now, he told Moses, he said, they only knew me by the name God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not revealed, was I not known unto them. You see, God in reassuring Moses and renewing his charge to him, also revealed his name to him. The divine titles are a most great, important subject of study. There is great significance in the names of God and the manner in which they are used in Scripture. Well, let's just do a little study for a few minutes on this now. You see, when we talk about God, we're told from the very first chapter of Genesis, that is, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. That the word, the Hebrew word translated God in that verse 1 is Elohim. And Elohim means the God who creates. The God that is the governor of all creation, all his creatures. And that word Elohim, God is used 2,570 times in the Old Testament. Now the name that is mentioned in um, in Exodus chapter 6, the first part of verse 3 is El Shaddai. El Shaddai just means God Almighty. And that was the name that God revealed unto Abraham, El Shaddai. And you know what that means? When the patriarchs knew that, it signified the all-sufficient one, the all-bountiful one. It shows the inexhaustible stores of his bounty, the riches and the fullness of his grace. On that basis, on that knowledge, on that revelation, they served the Lord. Now God revealed himself unto Moses by his new name. And that new name carried authority and power. And in fact, this is wonderful. He said, by my name Jehovah, did they not know me? And this name Jehovah is translated in the Old Testament with the word Lord, with capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Lord, when you see that in the Old Testament, it's referring to Jehovah. And it is used 6,823 times in the Old Testament. It is the name God revealed to him, God revealed himself unto Moses by when they were in great trial in Egypt. Jehovah is God's title as connected with his people by covenant relationship. God was about to manifest himself as a faithful performer of his word. The descendants of the patriarchs, that is, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of the fathers, would know him in a way their fathers had not known him. As the time drew near, when God will fulfill his covenant, and Israel will witness his faithfulness and power and deliverance, he revealed his name, Jehovah, unto them. Now, let's say this. You see, when we have trouble, and we go to pray, do you know what God does? God reveals himself more to us than we knew before so actually that's why we say from the test you go to the testimony the test has come if you slack back if you say because of the test because of the problem i will not pray i will not go to god i'll just be discouraged i'll stay in the corner i'll be crying i'll be crying in the toilet i will not pray there will be no testimony but you move from your test to, to the testimony to the revelation of the name and the power of God unto you. You see, it was because Moses went to God that this revelation was made unto him. Anytime you have problem, go to God in prayer. Anytime you have confusion, go to God in prayer. 
Anytime you have some things you cannot unravel, you cannot untie, you, you cannot understand, that's a mystery unto you. Go to God in prayer. And through that, he will make a revelation of himself unto you. God speaks to disappointed souls in prayer. Yes, he does. God speaks to discouraged spirits in prayer. Yes, he does. He will speak to you if you go to him in prayer. Look at verse 4 and verse 5. And I have also established my covenant with them. This God still talking unto Moses to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel. When the Egyptians keep, which the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered, I have remembered, think about that, I have remembered my covenant. God, have you forgotten me? I remember. God, have you forgotten the promise you made to me? I remember. God, have you forgotten my situation? I remember. God, have you forgotten that when I was going to come into the kingdom to be born again, this was a single problem that brought me to the kingdom. And the problem is still there. Oh, Lord, have you forgotten what brought me to the kingdom? God says, I remember. He never forgets. He remembers. He loves you and he remembers. Now stay with me. I'm going to look at something in verses 6, 7, and 8. Tremendous, wonderful, powerful things. Verses 6, 7, and 8. And I want you to even take your biro or take your pencil, take something with you because there are things you'll need to mark in these verses 6, 7, and 8. This is wonderful. You see, some people read the Bible and as they read the Bible, they, do, they just read. They don't understand the depth of truth, the depth of revelation that God is making unto, unto his own. Now, let's look at it. Verses 6, 7, and 8. I'm going to point out something to you that's very, very important. Let me read to you verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I told you before that whenever you see the Lord in capital L-O-R-D, it means I am Jehovah. I want you to look at verse 8. The very last part of verse 8. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. You know what that does? God says at the beginning, I am the Lord. He says at the end, I am the Lord. And then he puts seven things in between the first, I am the Lord, and the last, I am the Lord. He says, on the basis that I am the Lord, and there is no power that can resist my power successfully. On the basis that I am the Lord, there is nothing I promise that I cannot do. On the basis that I am the Lord, I'm making my commitment and my, my covenant with the children of Israel. And on the basis of that, he said a lot of things and then he closed it by saying, I am the Lord. Marvelous, tremendous thing. That is, all the things I'm going to read to you now, they were enclosed in the bracket of I am the Lord. They were prefaced and ended with I am the Lord. They were put in the compartment of I am the Lord. And then in between those two I am the Lord, it said I will, I will, I will. It said it seven times. Seven times. Look at it. It says, uh, I'm now reading from verse 6 again. I will bring you out from under the bodies of the, of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Which bringeth you from under the bodies of the Egyptians. And I will bring you in unto the land. Uh, concerning which I did swear to give each to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to, to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. So you will see that seven times God said, I am. I, he said, I will, I will, I will. I'll go over to you. I'll go over with you. Verses 6 and 7 and 8. So then, let's bring everything together. As we go over verses 6, 7, and 8. Number one, he said, I will bring you out from under the bodies. Number two, I will rid you out of their bondage. Number three, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. 
Number four, I will take you to me for a people. Number five, I will be to you a God. Number six, I will bring you into the, into the land. Number seven, I will give it you for an heritage. Now, you know that as you study the Bible, seven is a number for perfection, for completeness, for fullness. And so God here showed the completeness of the promise. It showed the perfection of what he was revealing to them. He said, I will, I will, I will, I will seven times. Now, let's summarize that section. Number one, his plan. I will bring you out. That's my plan. That's the agenda. That's the strategy. That's what we have on the drawing board in the court of heaven on the table. The divine architect, the divine planner was telling the children of Israel, I will bring you out. Number two, his pity. I will read you out of their bondage. Oh, I see your groaning. I see your tears. I see your concern. I see your perplexity. I see your sorrow. I pity you. It's pity. Because of his pity, he said, I will read you of their bondage. Number three is power. He says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Now, as we go through uh, the other chapters, chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, you will see when Moses had to stretch the hand, had to stretch the rod. When he said, I, was, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm, it's referring to his power. Number four, I will take you to me for a people. That's his purpose. The reason I'm doing all this is that I want to bring you out to myself as a possession. I want to bring you out to myself so that I will show forth my praise, his purpose. Now, number five, it says promise. It says, I will be to you a God. You see many gods in Egypt. You see many rulers and the people that claim sovereignty and deity in Egypt, but really all those are false gods. I will be to you a God. That's his promise. And then number six, I will bring you into, I will bring you in unto the land. That is his performance. He'll perform it. Yes, he'll perform it. He'll hasten his word to perform it. And then number seven, I will give it to you for an heritage. That's their possession. His plan, his pity, his power, his purpose, his promise, his performance, and their possession. You see, as you look at all these, and you see how God fulfilled everything to the letter, this is why we know that God's plan and God's promise and God's purpose for us and the new covenant will be fulfilled without anything to hinder him. Now we go to point number two. I'm sure that you like to still read over all these things on your own because it's just a death of truth, gem of truth. In all these uh, verses and passages that you will not just want to do a one-time study and that is it and that is all. You will want to go back over and over again and make sure that you get much out of the word of God. Now we go to Exodus chapter 6 from verse 9 to verse 13. Exodus chapter 6 from verse 9 to verse 13. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. But they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. It says, and Moses spake so. Let's stop there for a moment. And Moses spake so. You think about the message. Moses did not invent the message. Moses just told them exactly what God told him that's the quality of a good preacher that's the quality of a good servant of god that's the quality of a good minister it doesn't change the gospel it doesn't change the message he gives it to the people exactly as god has given it to him now everything in the message should have encouraged the children of israel everything in the message was intended to comfort them not to repel them Consider the author of the message, the bearer of the message, the nature of the message, the time of the message. Four things. The author of the message. Who was the author of the message? God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God, the covenant-keeping God. God, the one who remembered the affliction. God, the one who has come down to deliver them. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's the author of the message. And Moses did not say anything of his own mind. And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. 
You see, when you consider the author of the message we receive, you will see that it is supposed to do us good. The author of the message we receive every Monday, every Thursday, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Saturday, every time we go to the Word of God, the author of the message is God. And the message is supposed to comfort us, not to repel us, not to drive us away. It's supposed to help us, not to destroy us. Now think about the bearer of the message. The bearer of the message was Moses, a man who for their sake had sacrificed his position among the princes of Pharaoh. A man who gave up everything, even at the age of 80, was still willing to come and speak unto Pharaoh and act as a deliverer for the children of Israel. A man that could have easily come to the throne of Pharaoh, but he rejected that, wanting to suffer affliction with the people of God and not wanting to enjoy the pleasures of sin for his, uh, for his season. You see, that was the bearer of the message. Not only that, you want to consider the nature of the message. It was a, me it was a message of hope. A message of love. It was a message that was responding to their despondency. A message that was giving freedom unto the enslaved. Also, you want to consider the time. The time was the most appropriate time. The most appropriate time. When the bondage had become unbearable, God sent a message to them that the bondage was now almost over. And so, as you consider everything concerning the message, the author, the bearer, the nature, and the time, you will see that it was calculated to bring comfort unto them. But unfortunately, unfortunately, they rejected the message. The cause of their rejection of liberty was the extreme severity of their bondage. What a paradox. The slavery was excessively severe and therefore the slaves will, will not care for freedom. What a lesson we have to learn from here to us as unto them. It's the message of mercy, the message of hope, and the message of salvation preached. It proclaims deliverance to the captive. God recognizes all mankind, you know that, as slaves, and sends an offer of freedom, of forgiveness, of deliverance, of salvation. Christ is the messenger, the mediator of the covenant. A greater than Moses is there, publishing a greater salvation, a greater deliverance. Yet many do not regard the message. Why? Because of anguish of spirit, because of cruel bondage, all these things make the captives to hug their chains, to keep to their bondage, and to refuse to hear the voice that invites them to glorious liberty. What I want to say to you is this, beware of neglecting your spiritual state, your spiritual interest, either because of personal affliction or because of unjust oppression. Now you see, because of the anguish, you know what anguish does sometimes? Anguish will make a person to close his eyes to the promises of God. Anguish or trouble, difficulty, trial, will make a person to close his eyes to the wonderful promises of God. Do you remember in Mark chapter 9? Mark chapter 9, there was this man that brought his son to the Lord. As he brought his son to the Lord, the Lord said in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Look at the answer of the man in verse 24. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Oh, he was willing to believe God, but the anguish of the long-standing problem the anguish of the cruelty of the devil to his own beloved son. The anguish of had seen that child thrown into the fire, thrown into the water. The trauma, the suffering, the conflict within. Made even though he wanted to believe and he came to the disciples and he came to Christ. The anguish made him to, to have some unbelief. He said, oh Lord, I like to believe. I like to believe. But this trouble as I've seen this child thrown to the fire, thrown into the water. I've seen all the scars, all the marks on the body of the child. It just wants me to have unbelief. You know what he's saying? He's saying I'm in a conflict. I'm in a battle. On the one hand, my heart is saying, believe, believe, believe. On the other hand, when I open my eyes and I see all the marks and all the scars of the fire burning on the body of this child, there is the unbelieving part of me saying, can you believe that God can still do anything? So he said with tears, he said, Lord, I believe, but help 
thou mine unbelief. We should be careful of unbelief. Because you see, unbelief is very terrible. Unbelief will not allow a person to get all that God wants him to get or wants her to get. In Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Let's take heed, let's beware that we do not allow what we see, what we hear, what we feel to make us depart away from the Lord. I believe the Lord will help you. In fact, I believe the Lord is helping you already. As you study all these chapters in Exodus, I'm sure that you see a brighter view of God. I'm sure that it lifts up your faith. I'm sure that you are saying, if God could do that to those children of Israel who have stayed for about 400 years in the land of Egypt, if God could do that and he could deliver those people, if God could do that in the midst of the cruelty, in the midst of the tyrannical kind of action of Pharaoh and the taskmasters, I believe my own problem is even a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. If he did that for them, he'll do it for me. Come back to Exodus chapter 6 and see how the Lord continued to speak unto, uh, unto Moses and unto Aaron. In, Act, in, sorry, in Exodus chapter 6 verse 10. Exodus, Exodus. Exodus chapter 6 verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh king of Egypt that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Here is our uh, brother again. Here is Moses again. Again he's walking by sight. Again he's looking at the children of Israel. Again he's looking at their complaint. Again he's looking at the reaction of unbelief because of the anguish of the heart. And he said, the children of Israel have not hearkened to me. The people, the same flesh, the same bones, they have not hearkened unto me. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have not hearkened to me. My native people have not hearkened to me. The people of the same heart, the people of the same forefathers, the people of the same parentage, the people of the same covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have not hearkened to me. How shall Pharaoh the foreigner how shall Pharaoh the Egyptian, how shall Pharaoh the taskmaster, the tyrant, the representative of Satan ever be able to listen to me? Doesn't it show that because the children of, of Israel have not listened to me, I'm a man of uncircumcised lives? Isn't this what I complained of in the past? That I don't really have the ability to speak unto these people because if I had the ability, would they not have listened to me? How will Pharaoh listen unto me? Look at verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge. And gave them a charge. You know what? All those complaints of Moses did not make God to change his mind. And here is God telling you, stand up in the bus and preach. And you say, God, I've never done that before. I cannot do that. I will be trembling. My legs will be knocking one another. All that complaint will never make God to change. He says, rise up and speak. The Lord says, talk to your in-laws about the gospel and tell them that Jesus Christ came to save us from our sin. And you say, my in-laws, even to discuss ordinary problems of the family, what I think they should even see without any argument. They never see it. How can I ever talk to my in-laws about Jesus Christ? All that complaint will not make God change his mind. He says, give the gospel to those in-laws. And then there are times God will tell you, you, you go and surrender yourself and be a worker. Because by now with all that you know, with everything that you have learned, you ought to be leading us fellowship. You ought to be doing this for the Lord. You ought to be preaching the gospel. I've put so much into you. Oh, you say, I've tried a few times to even collect some people together in my place of work. And the thing broke up. It never worked at all. Do you know that all that complaint will not make God to change his mind? Let us understand if God is calling you, he's calling you. Your complaint that you are not educated, your complaint that maybe you still need to go to school, your complaint you need to go to evening classes, your complaint you need to brush up your grammar, your complaint you don't have good eyesight to be able to read the Bible, your complaint that even when you read you forget, your complaint that you tried it before but you failed, your complaint that you tried to follow up newcomers and they never respond, 
All that complaint will never change the mind of God. God is a wonderful God. Well, don't you know? He knew all those weaknesses before calling you. Are you giving God any information? I'm an illiterate. What a great information that you are giving to God. Didn't God know that before calling you? He knows all your problems. He knows all your weaknesses. He knows all your shortcomings. In spite of all those shortcomings, the Lord is still calling you. The Lord is still calling you. Why just don't you say, God, I know you will never leave me alone. I know that you have put this burden upon me to work for you. Oh, Lord, I will. But here is our brother. Here is Moses. How he, you know, kept on complaining. And, but you see, the Lord still said, speak unto the children of Israel. Speak unto Pharaoh. You know, here is Moses. And he complained about two, two people. He complained about the children of Israel. He said, they have not hearkened unto me. He complained about Moses, about uh, Pharaoh. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Then look at verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel. Unto the children of Israel. Unto the children of Israel. I will never do anything in this district anymore. They never listen to me. I want her to be changed. I don't want to be a coordinator over this district again. I don't want to be a zonal leader in this zone again. I don't want to do anything woman coordinator. I don't want to be a woman coordinator in this district. They don't respect me. They don't accept me. They don't see anything I say. And guess the next thing the Lord tells you. It says right in that same district. What? That's God. He knows that's where God has appointed for you to do something. There's no way you can come out of it. God told Moses, he said, those same children of Israel, I'm giving you a charge, go and speak unto them. Then he said, that same Pharaoh, Pharaoh the king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now we come to the third part. And the third part, we'll quickly go through this. This is just telling us about some names. I'm reading to you from verse 14. Exodus chapter 6, from verse 14. Look at it. These be the heads of their father's houses, the son of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanok, and Palu, and Ezron, and Kamai. These be the families of Reuben. Verse 15. And the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jezin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of, of a Canaanitish woman. These are the families of Simeon. And these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon, and Kohath, and Mirari, the years of the life of Levi were an hundred and thirty and seven years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shemai, according to their families, and the sons of Kohath, Amram, Isaac, and Hebron, and Uziel. The years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. And the sons of Merari, Mehalai, and Mushai. These are the families of Levi, according to their generations. And Amram took him, Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife. And she bare him, Aaron, and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. And the sons of Ezer, Korah, and Nephek, and Zikri. And the sons of Uziel, Mishael, and Eliza, Elzaphan, and Zithri. And Aaron took him, Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Naashon, to wife. And she bare him, Nadab, and Abihu, Elisha, and Itamar, and the sons of Korah, Ashil, and Elkanah, and Abiasab. These are the families of the Kohathites, and Eliezer, Aaron's son, to him, one of the daughters of Patiel, to wife, and she bare him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers of the Levites, according to their families. 
You know, I've read a passage to you. If we're going to study this at the time of study scripture on Sunday, and they're going to call somebody to read, you'll be praying in your heart. I hope they don't call me to read that kind of passage because all those names, am I going to pronounce them? Well, I did it for you now. You know, you wonder why did they put something like this in the Bible? Well, this is to show us and to give to us the genealogy of God's ambassadors. You see, Moses and Aaron came from the tribe of Levi. And this genealogy is to give us, is to show us that these people came from the tribe of Levi. There's no time for me to be able to read all the references you have on your outline. But let me point out some things to you. The reason why this is part of the study that we're having at this time. The list of names here given are to remind Israel. The, the list was to remind Israel that God's ambassadors Aaron and Moses were flesh of their flesh and bone of their bones. You see, that helps a lot. When the people knew that these people are not foreigners, these people are not strangers, you see, Moses had been away for 40 years in the land of Midian. And now Aaron had joined him. And these two people were ministering to the children of Israel. They needed to know that these people were part of them. They were part of the descendants of Abraham. In fact, their tribe was spelled out. They came from the tribe of Levi. These two great men represented God before Israel and represented God's demand unto Pharaoh. They were not strangers. They were men from among their brethren. This is why verses 16 to 25 are devoted to the tribe of Levi, from which Moses and Aaron came, while only verses 14 and 15 speak of the tribes of Reuben and of Simeon. Now let's concentrate on the tribe of Levi, because the verses actually uh, in the major concentrated on the tribe of Levi. I want you to notice something to start with, and we're going to read this in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, I'm reading to you from verse 5. Genesis 49, from verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not, me, be not united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. What do you learn from that? There was a curse on Levi, as, as well as on Simeon. When you think about that, that's very significant. That even though there was a curse on Levi, and it even says, I will scatter them in Israel. Now, there are some people that feel that once there is a curse, there's nothing you can do about it. In fact, there are some Christians among us, they say, well, although I'm born again, although I'm a child of God, although I've surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, but you know, there's a curse in our family. And because of that curse on my great-great-great-grandfather, because of that, I cannot do anything successfully. I want to encourage you. That Moses came from the tribe of Levi. There was a curse on Levi. But then, because he submitted himself to God, and Aaron, because Aaron submitted himself to God, the curse was not effective upon them. And God used them as great, mighty instruments in his hand. Honored instruments of, of deliverance. Do you see the language of that curse? When Jacob cursed them, he said, mine honor, be not thou united with them. He was saying that the honor that was upon Jacob, because of the covenant, will not be united with Simeon and Levi. And yet, even though it might have taken something on Levi himself, when it came to those descendants, those descendants did not have any cause upon them. Would you say there was any cause upon Moses after I started serving the Lord? Any cause upon Aaron, after I started serving the Lord, here you are. There might have been a cause in your village, a cause in your family, a cause in the extended family. You have come to the Lord. You reject that curse. 
You see, when you accept that cause, and after being a Christian, you are saying, well, our family is under a cause, my daddy was under a cause, his daddy was under a cause, my great-great-great-grandfather was under a cause, and that is why I will never do anything successful. That is why the work of God will never prosper in my hand. That is why I will never have any child. That is why I will never get married. That is why, because, you know, this is what has been happening to our family. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the curse is cancelled. Why? It's made a curse for us. Because cursed be everyone that hangs upon a tree. That we should not be under that curse anymore. The curse is broken. So that we can now inherit the promise of God through Abraham. So then, you are no more under a curse. In fact, we're going to you know, continue with this. Amram and Jochebed, the parents of Aaron and Moses demonstrated faith in God and they brought up their three children Moses, Aaron and Miriam to serve the Lord actively. Isn't that a wonderful lesson for us? Look at the condition in our country now. Look at the trauma. Look at the economy. Look at the confusion. And look at all the suffering. Look at everything that is going on. And yet do you know there are people that are trying to keep two jobs and three jobs they have no time for their children at all. It was such a, such a difficult time that Moses and Aaron were born. And yet their parents, at such a difficult time, still brought them up in the way of the Lord. Train your children. Train your children. Impart faith into your children. Bring up your children in the nurture and the favor of the Lord. We don't know if Jesus tarries. They may become the honored mighty instruments of deliverance of salvation for multitudes of people in years to come. Not only that, I want you to even think of the whole tribe. The whole tribe, the whole tribe of the Levites. Do you know when? After they had come out of Egypt. And now Moses had gone to the mountain to receive the law. And was coming down. He saw that all the children of Israel had gone away from the Lord. Then, you know the whole story about the climax and the conclusion of it is, he was at the edge of the camp. And then he said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And guess what happened? All the tribe of Levi came unto him. Suppose they had said, Levi was under a curse. Maybe you will never be able to serve the Lord acceptably. You see, they never accepted that. And they came to Moses. They came to the Lord. And the Lord chose them to become his priests and his servants. And if you read your Bible very well, God became their inheritance. God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's favor and God's salvation and God's service, God's reward and inheritance are all available to whosoever will repent. Whosoever will believe in Christ, whatever his father might have done in the past, whatever his forefathers might have done in the past. Let's conclude before we pray in Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. We're looking at it from verse 26 to verse 30. These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are they which spake to Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. That's just emphasizing to us that the reason why all this, uh, this genealogy is written is to bring out the fact that Moses and Aaron came from a particular tribe, the tribe of Levi. And then in verse 28, and it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. Speak unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt. All that I say unto thee, and Moses said, Before the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? What we discover here in this passage is God's unchanging commission. Though Moses complained of being of uncircumcised lips again, God commanded and commissioned, God commandment and commission did not change. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak thou unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. All that I say unto thee. The Lord was saying, the service must be continued because the command of God had not been fully executed. 
Moses and Aaron were, were sent on exactly the same work as before. You see, this is what we need to learn. Those of us who minister, those of us who preach the gospel, those of us who serve the Lord in his church, this is what we need to understand. There is much waste of effort in many churches because the men are so restless and they are given to change in message and method. You see, there are some people that are not stable. There are some people that, you see, if they see that the children of, if they saw that the children of Israel were not cooperating and Pharaoh was not cooperating and nobody was yielding, you know what they will do? They will change the message. But the Lord is saying, there's no change in the message. Is Pharaoh rebellious? There's no change in the message. It are the children of Israel doubting? There's no change in the message. You see, when we preach repentance, and maybe you do not find many people repenting, do we change the message? No. When you preach holiness and sanctification, and you find that some people will argue, do we change the message? No. When you preach the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and you preach it according to the word of God, and you see that the people are complaining that we need to add something and add another thing, so it will become easy for the people to maybe to manifest this and manifest that. Do we change the message? No. When you preach the word of God, and it appears that there are some other churches around trying to contradict and trying to say, why should it be like that? Do we change the message? No. We keep on contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. In Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord. Fear thou the Lord. If we fear the Lord, are we going to change his message? Are we going to modify his message? Are we going to um, alter his message? No, not at all, my son. Fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. We need determination. We need concentration. We need perseverance in our effort. To rescue the perishing and to save the lost. Failure is no excuse for fickleness in Christian service. You see Moses complain again. You see the people have not listened to me. I'm of uncircumcised lips. How can I do this? That is no excuse in our service to the Lord. Let us concentrate all our energies patiently and persistently on our Christian calling and service. We've learned a lot today. We've seen this chapter 6, and I've told you already at the beginning, when you come to chapter 7, a change takes place, a dramatic change takes place. If you've been with us all through this chapters 1 to 6, you want to be with us next Monday if the Lord tarries for chapter 7, because there's something, there is something wonderful, something that will revolutionize your Christian life, your Christian thinking. As we go through the next section, which is actually chapters Seven all through to chapter 12. And for now, let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. With all that he has taught us today, God's revelation of his name, God's revelation of his power. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. All that the Lord has taught you, bring everything back to the Lord. If you have complained before, if you have demonstrated inexperience and weakness of heart, if you have demonstrated unbelief, if you have demonstrated a kind of fickleness, you know, uh, changing, you are you're, you're, you're bending and you say, well, this and this and complaints and all that. Let's come before the Lord and just say, Lord, we're sorry for all the things we have said wrong, all the actions we have taken wrong. If you have said, I cannot serve in this district, I cannot serve in this area, when the Lord has appointed you in this place, let's tell the Lord, oh Lord, I will joyfully do what you want me to do. In the place you want me to do it. Let's bring all the lessons we learned to the Lord in prayer.